Um, welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Um, our webinar will begin shortly. Today, we are going to hear from Julia Long, Jodie Woodward, Nick Nesbitt and Anne Rosillo. And they're going to be talking about Marilyn Fry's separatism and uh, moving on then to Sonia Johnson's Taking Our Eyes Off the Guys. Radical Feminist Perspectives is a series of webinars which is run by radical feminists whose voices have been cancelled or silenced in universities, schools and the media and all sorts of other places. Um, we're frustrated that we can't share what we know in these places, so we are offering this online series of webinars and thank you so much. Um, to everybody who's come you you will know that there's I guess that there's a chat function available so do chat um, and so put uh, put ideas into the chat and there's also a Q&A question um, so, section so you can put questions that you want for the participants whether this panelists sorry into the into the chat so I'm really really happy to uh, get started on this. We've got Julia Long, Jodie Woodward, Nick Nesbitt and Anne Rosillo. Uh, so welcome and over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Joe. Does everyone, should we just all each say hello first, just so that everyone knows <laughs> and say who, who we are. So I'm Julia. I'm Jodie. I'm Nick. I'm Anne. So hi everyone. We're really pleased to be, um, rather than being all in our separate little cells on Zoom that um, we've actually managed to do this when, when we're all together. We had a bit of a late night last night, so hopefully <laughs> hopefully there won't be anything too sort of uh, bleary and bleary eyed and incoherent about it. But um, but when Joe was first, um, you know, when Joe and I were <coughs> discussing uh, you know, this series and the kinds of things that we talk about, I knew that one of the things I was really keen to talk about was this particular essay by Marilyn Fry, and then when I was in touch with uh, Jodie and Nick about it, um, I, I think it was one of the, it's one of those pieces that has really resonated and that we uh, with us and that we keep going back to. Um, and I really I just love the clarity of, of Marilyn Fry's writing. So we thought we'd begin. I'd just do a very brief summary of some of the main uh, sort of themes and connections that Fry makes in this essay. Um, I really, really recommend if you haven't read it already. I think it's 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 such a brilliant piece of writing. Um, it is actually maybe I shouldn't say this, it is actually available online if you if you don't um, if you don't have the the, the politics of reality that, that, that it comes from. But um, anyway, so um, in this essay, it's, which is actually called "On Separatism and Power," um, Marilyn Fry begins by talking about um, feminist separation. And she talks about um, feminist separation as being um, a common and consistent theme in any effective feminist act, in, in any act that she thinks is actually going to make a difference. And, um, and she talks about separation. Um, she doesn't go straight into talking about maybe some of our stereotypical ideas about separatism. She talks about um, the things like uh, I don't know, um, divorce or not watching uh, TV or um, yeah, breaking up from a relationship or uh, not not um, uh, not working for a male employer. You know all of these kinds of things, and um, and she notes that there's there's always some element of uh, like when people talk about separatism, there's often some element of kind of either being very disparaging or very hostile to separatism. And so she poses the question really early on that what is it about separation in any or all of its many forms and degrees that makes it so basic and so sinister, so exciting and so repellent? And so in the essay, she sets out to answer that, that question. And she has some sort of main ideas that um, that she brings together in order to answer that question. And I would say the first one is um, the kind of idea of the experience of male parasitism. And she's, she argues that, um, that men live parasitically on women. And she demonstrates that through various examples, like she gives the example of abortion, but also the, um, the kind of uh, hostility and often violence that men express um, 
and perpetrate, and perpetrate when, say, for example, like when a woman leaves them or when a woman like closes off access to him in, in some way. So she uses that to illustrate this relationship of parasitism. Um, and she, from that, she goes on to talk about issues of access and definition. And she says that, um, that there's um, a, an inseparable relationship between access and power. Those who have power have access to those who don't have power. So for example, if, if you're in work and your manager uh, send you an email requesting you to go and see, you know, go and see them. You pretty much have to do that, but it's not an equal relation. It's not a reciprocal relationship. You can't um, like do the same kind of summon, you know, the, the head of your um, workplace to come and to come and see you because obviously there's that asymmetrical um, relationship. So she says that um, that by that separation involves denying men access and um, and. It's making an it's making an assertion of power um, and changing the relationships, the asymmetrical power relationships between women and men. And in doing that, it's also redefining the relationship. It's redefining boundaries. Um, and she argues that that this is kind of um, but, but one of this denial of access is it's fundamental to effective feminism, and it's also what is so threatening about it but she says that the first act of taking control has to be the denying access and there always must be some element or some act of no saying from women um, in order to um to take some kind of control or power so um so i think <coughs> would you say that's a reasonable yeah kind of summary I think so. I think it's, and i think it's it's really significant the way that she does talk about so many different forms of separatism and kind of I think it's quite interesting the way that she talks about women's motivations for separatism so she talks about how for some women you know it might be as you said about things like divorce that it's about a personal relationship but then for other women it's kind of much more political and I think she kind of really talks through all of those different sort of levels of separatism which I think is was really powerful for me the first time that I read it, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it's really, I really like the fact that she begins with just the idea of separation, because I think any woman, and that's going to resonate to any woman, like uh, whether she's in any way, you know, considers herself to be feminist or even really is even familiar with that word, or um, it's something that is, is such a, Kind of common experience and strategy and the fact that she kind of moves from that into saying that separatists practice separate separation more consistently and sort of consciously and mm -hmm. um, obviously in a very overt political way than other acts of, se of women's separation i thought was really powerful because i don't know what you do think but i think there there's a lot of kind of an abstract idea of the, the separatist, the lesbian separatist, or the separatist that is, that feels, I think you were saying before, that it feels really kind of out of reach or abstract to... Yeah, I think when most people first get an idea of separatist, they think of women who completely separate themselves from society, they take themselves off to go and live in a caravan in the woods somewhere, um, um, that is just completely out of reach. Um, one of the things about being out of reach that I thought was quite interesting thinking about sort of today's current sort of climate is that it very, at the very beginning she lists different places where there is kind of forms of separatism so she mentions things like uh, well women's refugees or, or battered women's shelters are the things she refers to it in there but she lists a lot of things that actually we don't have now anyway so she lists things like women's bars or women's mm. art or things like that and so that really struck me when I reread it this time was about how much actually we don't even have a lot of those spaces anymore anyway so then you know at the time that it's written she's talking about you know different different ways that there are forms of separatism that actually now we don't we don't have things like women's mm. bars we don't have things like you know women's bookshops or, or those kinds of things that a lot of those places have have disappeared anyway so now for, for women maybe coming to sort of thinking about separatism now there's also less access to to those kinds of um options for separatism anyway yeah um, 
which yeah. is, you know I hadn't necessarily the first time that I read it um hadn't really kind of picked up on that but it really struck me this time that actually how many of those places um still exist even yeah so, yeah absolutely and obviously as well like at the time that this was written it was before all the transgender as sort of onslaught wasn't it so i think her the, the way that she ends it just sounds so um where is it the way that she ends it just sounds so prescient where she says um um the original sin like for those for those of us who do practice some kind of you know level or form of separatism um she said the original sin is the separation which uh, you know our, the acts that we do within that which these presuppose and it is that act of separation not our art or philosophy not our speech making nor our sexual acts or abstinences for which we will be persecuted when worse comes to worst it's such a really chilling ending isn't it and you think gosh just who could have imagined exactly how much worse and you know that it could get and how much worse is it going to get i just found that and the fact that she says it's the act of separation is what is seen as the problem rather than once once you've separated what you do within that it's less because i think a lot of the time especially within a sort of feminist activism there's a lot of focus on what you're doing and you know and, but often it doesn't even necessarily really involve that yeah. original act of separation mm -hmm. it's more about a kind of responding or you know mm -hmm. modifying or something but i was one of the questions i was that i sort of thought about that i thought might be interesting to discuss is Obviously, Fry begins um, her exploration of the subject by um, talking about the hostility to separatism and the sort of disparagement of separatism. And I just wondered whether whether that resonated with with any, I know it resonated with me, but whether that resonated with any of us in a, kind of at any level of the you know the what she says about separation. And if we wanted to talk about any of yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think that um definitely definitely for me i guess in in lots of different ways and at lots of different times so i think you know this was a really powerful essay for me and was actually quite significant even in me deciding to become lesbian and like to com com completely kind of stop having relationships with men and obviously at that time um, that was a really difficult time in terms of a lot of friendship groups or a lot of people that I knew that couldn't understand that decision and you know that was a really sort of obvious form of hostility because it felt you know it felt to, to people around me that that was me being an extremist that it was completely unnecessary and that was difficult for you know for a, a time sort of 10 years ago or, or whenever it was but I think one of the things that I think is I've experienced that I find quite difficult now is the fact that actually now even within sort of sort of feminist circles or kind of around sort of maybe sort of what would be considered gender critical feminism that actually there's still a lot of hostility to certain forms of separatism so that it's you know we're, we're allowed to talk about things like i say allowed in feminist circles to talk about things like women's refuges but actually when you kind of start talking about kind of restricting access to men to other parts of your life that is something that's quite often derided or you're told that that's that's not really what we're focusing on we're, we're focusing on particularly women having particular spaces when they've been abused but there's kind of hostility you know things like you know even when people talk about toilets and things like that and public toilets and that obviously we all have men in our own homes and in our own toilets and actually not all of us do you know, so I do think that that's one of the things that I found more challenging is that actually even within kind of feminist circles, you're quite often told to talk about particular forms of separatism mm. and particular ideas, but that you can kind of meet hostility if you sort of are considered to be sort of taking it too far. So I definitely think that that's in some ways been more difficult than possibly separating initially from, from people who maybe didn't share similar politics to me. Yeah, I think separatism can be viewed in feminist circles as it's okay if it's for a purpose. 
So if you're in a women's refuge because a man's done something terrible to you, then that's okay because you need that space. But the idea that women want to separate just to just to be doesn't seem to be accepted in the same way. And um, I think a lot of feminists are actively hostile and they'll preface things that they say, I'm against separatism, but you know, this, this is okay. <laughs> <laughs> a bit like, I'm not transphobic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's good old prefacing <laughs> games. Um, and I know when we were talking about this before, you were you were saying that you kind of really appreciated that in some ways more or less well, I suppose through your mum that you felt you had quite a separatist sort of upbringing. Mm. And do you want to say something about that? Because that was really interesting when we were talking before about it. Yeah, I mean, I, my my mum and dad split up when I was, um, I suppose, about six or seven. Um, and my mum was um, a community midwife and um, I was just then surrounded, really, um, by women, um, and and I uh, we were talking about it sort of like last night, and I really do think that 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 has benefited me um, throughout my life or whatever. That that I I don't have, I don't need to have men in sort of like my life. I don't need to have them sort of in my spaces or whatever. I can. Um, you know, I, I, and I don't even feel bad about not sort of having, having, a, a, you know, a men around or whatever, that, that, you know, I don't feel that, um, you know, I see so many sort of like women just, um, trapped in a way with, with men and feeling that they, they need to sort of, you know, um, listen to them and, entertain them and be there for them and I've, I've never felt uh, never felt like that and I think that's it's benefited me through through my life particularly in male dominated um, work environments that that um, you know I've been able to um, sort of like challenge men quite openly um, you know about their about their behavior and, and not tolerate um, having to be sort of like um, a, a woman who um, is, is just going to be, you know, expected to sort of, um, you know, listen to them and, um, yeah, I'd say entertain them in a way, and that, that kind of, um, you know, laugh at their jokes and kind of um, be there as a sounding board or whatever. I just, you know, I was so lucky growing up that I, I was around so many women um, who were, I mean, particularly my mother, who was a very strong character anyway, but to, to have so many, you know, women in my life, um, I think really did, did benefit me and, and uh, has allowed me to sort of be that different, you know, um, and, and not not focus on men like you know the Sonia Johnson thing you know taking our eyes off the guys you know from a very early age um that that you know well, wasn't a, a, a thing in my life you know I think what you were saying there about the sort of uh, it's so much part of the heterosexual matrix isn't it that all you know what Fry says about the relationship between power and access so so part of that sort of traditional role of women within, or maybe the defining part of it, within the kind of matrix that she talks about of heterosexuality and marriage and motherhood involves that not, you know, really being, it's very, very difficult for women to set boundaries when you're in the, in the yeah, yeah, matrix yeah. and we know that men respond with violence when you do set those mm. boundaries because we know that obviously uh, for you two are very very conscious of that in your work that when um and maybe and like your um, previous work as well that you know the most dangerous time for a woman in terms of you know really real serious threat like risk to her life is from the violence that uh, you know a man may perpetrate when you know at the point where she's made that decision to leave him and 
you know, sometimes I know when we were, you know, when we were, um, when I was involved on working on the femicide census, you know, we, we catalogued as far as we could tell from the information that was available, um, you know, at what point were, where it was, where the woman was killed by a male partner or a former partner, like at what point was she most likely to be killed by him? And it was overwhelmingly within that first year. And within that, as I remember, like overwhelmingly within the first three months. And sometimes if she hadn't actually even separated, but it appeared that she'd taken some kind of steps to separate or even started a conversation. Like it was so, so we know that all of these kind of acts of accommodation and sort of placation, you know, it's, there, there is a very, very, it's, you know, it's based on a very well-founded, even if not a f conscious fear, but it's based on something that's very well founded. And and then I think obviously once, you know, as Jodie, you were talking about, once you take that into the political domain, <coughs> you then see that hostility, sort of, you know, the same kind of um, hostility and will to violate those spaces um, brought to bear on women who have a more kind of conscious, politicised, um, you know, attempt at separatism. No, absolutely. And, and that idea as well that, say, you know, working in the women's sector, also the idea that it's, you know, from a from a perspective of, say, delivering a service or, or providing support, that there's also something around the fact that we, we support women to also make that one act of separation as safe as it possibly can be. But then the frustrating thing about that is obviously then we're still sort of perpetuating something, which is to suggest that other future relationships might be safer or more fulfilling but again you still have that you're still always going to have that same risk around a certain boundary saying no and what that what that creates for what that creates for women so i think it's yeah absolutely one of the things <laughs> i know i always like to talk about radfem 2012 <laughs> it's like my really kind of favorite you know uh, anecdote to, to be shared, but like, I, I just, I don't know, it seems relevant that when I remember when I first moved back to England in sort of 2006, 2007, and I got involved with the, the London Feminist Network, and the London Feminist Network was, I don't know, it was probably the only women only kind of activist group at the time. I, I, there might have been others, like, yeah, but actually they probably were, but certainly the ones that were around that I remember in London. That, it was it was very very unusual in that it was set up as a women only organisation and the various others that were kind of emerging and springing up at a similar kind of time were things like Objects and uh, UK Feminista and they were, I know Objects have changed a lot over the years it's a long time ago that I'm talking about but at the time um, that those who set up Objects and also definitely you know the woman who set up but you that were kind of like they were quite evangelical about involving men they were really kind of positively wanted men to come along to the meetings and and their rationale for that was um oh if we want to change society like men are half society and they're the ones with power so if we don't bring them up on board then nothing will change it was uh, and um and even with, I remember even within LFN, and it is quite a, you know, what is it now, 14 years ago I'm talking about, 10, 15 years ago, um, it was quite a regular thing, like when new women would come along, it was quite a regular thing to say like, but why don't we have men at these meetings? And we just, it was one of those revolving door conversations that it would just kind of get brought up and then you'd have the same sort of justification of it and I think that's why I just love this essay because it is so clear and it's so like it just makes it so obvious as to why that act of no saying is so fundamental and if you don't get if you don't do that I don't know really I think what's, what's the point of sort of much else but but it's just it, at that time it there was um <clears throat> There was really, uh, I suppose it was very much to do with that kind of the loss of knowledge and experience of, you know, that previous generation of women. And actually, I think quite an arrogance that this new generation kind of knew better than them. And I know when we did Radfem 2012, that was the first women only conference that we that had happened in, you know, years, like, you know, probably decades. And the hostility to that, obviously, there was a lot of 
uh, hostility was driven by all the transgenderists, but pretty much no one was really on our side at the time, or certainly wouldn't be vocally on our side. So I, for me, that was like when she talks about the hostility and disparagement and that, you know, the, uh, that was very much my experience of, of that, you know, at the time. And I think there's also that kind of idea that sometimes, I think there's something, I can't remember if it's in, in this essay, I think it's in this one and not the Sonia Johnson one, but also that idea where, um, was it says something like it's like a cowardly route being a separatist, like it's almost mm -hmm. that you're you're removing yourself because it's sort of it's easier for you and that what we need to do is we need to sort of you know stay within the system and and try to change men and you know that comes across quite strongly I would say still now this idea that I sometimes feel like maybe um, certain women might think that particularly within the sector you know that maybe I I care less or I'm less interested in supporting women because I'm not talking about all of the things that we could do to try to, to change men or to challenge things within the system. And it's just, you know, it's the complete opposite mm -hmm. of that. But there's a kind of possibility where you're just leaving women to it. And it's like, well, then that's not what, what I'm doing at all. Mm -hmm. But it's about actually, you know, kind of having, you know, being a separatist or having degrees of, you know, that kind of separatism and being able to show that is actually a really positive thing. But it's considered sometimes that, you know, that's just that's almost the easier like way out. Like it's you're leaving, if you're, like it's escapist, like that idea that you're just, you're, mm -hmm. you're kind of leaving other women to it, which, you know, mm -hmm. isn't the case at all. Mm -hmm. um, but that kind of, yeah, that really struck me that it was, again, that sort of hostility and, and that idea that, you know, we should, we should all be, be involved with trying to sort of involve men or, or change men, because that's, that's really where the, the real issue lies. And I was saying yesterday about, even just things like, um, if I think a few years ago, I probably would have, you know, on Twitter, if you see lots of sexism or misogyny, you know, I would have directly responded to men to sort of challenge that in a way that now I would just completely ignore it and not engage with it. But I think sometimes that can be seen as that women that do engage with it, it's because they care more because they're mm -hmm. challenging things mm -hmm. in a different way. And it's, it's, you know, whereas for me, it's not about that. It's about also having a, a completely different mindset. And um, so, yeah, I think it really, it, that really resonated in there. I mean, I think as well, and I don't know, like, Nick, maybe you've got some ideas about it, but like, it, like I really agree with what you're saying, Jodie, that, that within sort of, I don't know, how we define it like mainstream feminism or within the sector or gen gender critical feminism you know these kind of um, arenas there there is often even sometimes from quite surprising quarters there's a real disparaging of separatism and these kind of quite mocking you know oh it's sort of knit your own lentils you know you know like live kind of and and the kind of real sort of um uh I think the hostility is like, yeah, you've given up. You're just, you're kind of trying to escape and it's very self-serving. And like those of us who are serious are kind of in the fray and doing all of this. And I, I don't know, Nick, do you sort of, I know you're quite active on Twitter and stuff. Or, or are you? I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't say that. I, I know both of you are, but do you sort of, I suppose there probably isn't that much discussion about separatism, but do you see much of that kind of like male engagement, engagement with men and all the, I don't know, I don't even know what I'm asking, I'm just... Yeah, I mean, I suppose it happens all the time, like, a man will say something, something stupid and then, you know, a hundred women will pile on to tell him off and tell him what a misogynist he is, but it's just giving him that attention that he's mm. desperately looking for, it's like, yeah. almost like toddlers, they don't... We don't mind if the attention's positive or negative as long as they're getting it. So I just don't see what the point is in telling a man he's a dog. He knows. Fuel, isn't it? Um, they call it yeah, yeah, fuel that they're mm. craving. That. And again, like the, they're getting access to you yeah. very, very easily. Yeah. Like they're getting very easy access. Like, and, and, and absolutely. And, and then, a, you know, they know exactly what they're doing and, and they're quite happy to sit there for six, seven, eight hours <laughs> and, you know, come out with utter rubbish um whilst they know that that is they've got that group of women's yeah, full attention for that, mm -hmm. for that length of time and, and who wants to you know god there are better things that women could be doing for themselves mm -hmm. and and 
enjoying their you know time rather than sort of like yeah. Um, you could be cutting your toenails instead. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Anything suddenly would become instantly <laughs> fascinating. Yeah. Because, yeah. because the thing is, 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 is that um, you know what what I learned is that that is that these men are such a drain on women's time, and um, that's exactly why they do what they do. And they, you know, there's, there's no, it's not about sort of like, oh, there's no winning with them or whatever. Just don't give them the the access to you, you know. Um, because, you know, I could go on Twitter at eight o'clock in the morning and some guy has, has you know, come out with some utter crap. And as, as Nick said, you know, there's, there's women who, you know, um, go and defend their position or whatever and start arguing with them or whatever else. And I can come off Twitter 10 minutes later and then go on at six o'clock in the evening. Mm. And my God, it's the this... same women having yeah. the same argument with the same man. And you just think, God, what, you know, you, you could have been, I don't know, like, you know, cutting your toenails or, <laughs> or picking fluff out of your navel or, or whatever. Stroking your dog. Yeah, yeah. you know, having a, having a nap, having a, you know, <laughs> meeting with friends or whatever, you know, why are you given this? I think I think we have to be a bit careful though because I don't want I I don't want to think that oh it's all these stupid women who are doing that no, and I don't, don't because know. like basically like one of the things that I think um, Marilyn Fry is, is very honest about is is the the consequences of separatism mm. and the more kind of separatist you become like there are mm. real sanctions for that and most of us work in some way like work for men it, you know in terms of even if it's indirect even if we work in a women only environment like where is that funding coming from who you know um and so we're all kind of part of it aren't we and mm. because that's one of the things that was very striking to me that she says quite early on is is um the economic sanction if like if you refuse to work for men then there's going to be a mm. massive economic consequence mm. of that really serious and and I think as well um, that we can all give sort of t time and attention, e you know, like I, I, well, for example, myself, I worked for this couple of years on the femicide census, which actually was, although it's about naming the women who were, you know, victims of, you know, men uh, killing them, it, a lot of it was giving attention to the men, to what they did mm -hmm. and how they did it, and you know. So I just think it's very easy to mm -hmm. see when other women are doing it. Oh, look, they could be doing something more productive. Yeah. But actually, uh, and I think it really comes down to um, actually maybe we should go on and talk about the Sandra Johnson essay because she says that when she talks about taking our eyes off the guys, she says that women are seasoned into thinking that uh, and really believing and that kind of. Um, yeah, believing that what men do is really important because that's the model that we've all grown up with in some way or another. And it's actually um, fundamentally a lack of, of kind of, um, of confidence or awareness of our female selves. It, I think she's absolutely right that it always kind of comes down to that and a lack of, um, yeah, willingness to to put our, invest our energy into ourselves, you know, the, in the daily S sense of having a capital yeah. S. And to me, that that is kind of resonates with all these different levels of yeah. where, where you're going to put your attention, where you're going to put your energy. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe um, that's right. And I think also just to, to say as well, because I think I'm, I'm talking about, obviously, in terms of my personal experience about what I might choose to do privately now and where I might choose to spend my time, but equally, professionally I'm still working all of the time around things like change trying to change systems around legislation and things to do with rape and a lot of that also involves talking with men and engaging with men so you know as you say we, we all have different levels for different reasons of things that we are engaged in so it's not to, to sort of criticize why for some women that is also around getting really annoyed with men on Twitter but it's just that you know my own mindset has shifted so much over the years around why would I focus my energy there but I think you know we've all got we've all got competing things all of the time and so yeah I, I agree and but 
I do think as well that it's it's also about um, an experience of what is possible mm -hmm. because I think the like again Marilyn Fine talks about this like the more time that you the the further you go along this kind of you know path of separatism or whatever that with all these separations they just become your normal life mm -hmm. so you don't really think anything of it and maybe that's why it's very kind of it's it's quite stark when you see other women who are in a very very different you know, much more embedded in that kind of heterosexual mat matrix and um that is sort of very visible but i'm also aware that there are you know there's it, it's kind of oh, i you sound such a cliche to say it's a journey but yeah. I mean, it, is, it is a journey that can take probably all kind of unimagined directions that i yeah. haven't even begun to imagine yet and i do feel that especially at the moment politically you know with the transgender you know ons onslaught um like often we are i you know i do think it is really important that they didn't bring in self-id here and that that you know that move was halted maybe just temporarily i don't know so i don't know there's yeah. there's all the, always this bit insider outsider kind of tension i suppose mm -hmm. but what i don't know we've got Kind of got a bit of time left. Did anyone want to say anything particularly about the Sonia Johnson essay, or did you think it kind of related to what Pry is saying, or I don't know, any ideas? Do you want to share any ideas about that? Or? I mean, I think yeah. I mean, obviously, so Sonia, the Sonia Johnson piece, she talks about. Um, she talks about kind of the idea of sort of seasoning and, and how women, as you say, in terms of that kind of heterosexual matrix around um, the kind of family and religious institutions and how that she uses this idea of seasoning in a way that probably we might now talk about kind of almost grooming, um, you know, girls and, and women into, into a particular position. And then she moves on to, I suppose, to talk about how we need to separate when we're talking about separatism that it's actually around not thinking about men or not kind of asking ourselves the question how will men respond to this you know she talks much more about that i think in a much more kind of also your your whole mindset shifting your whole mindset so that things aren't in a response to men so whereas marion fry is talking about almost asserting that boundary and the no saying she's really kind of taking it that next level and thinking about it not as in response to men which I mm. you know which I thought was was really was really quite powerful and I hadn't actually read that piece before and I think it's something that you know we've certainly talked about that before that you know it's about kind of taking it that step away from not thinking about things as a as a you know as a rejection of men or as a, a kind of a no saying but actually around kind of creating something that's quite separate where men isn't you know men aren't the focus at all and so yeah i thought that that was quite uh yeah i thought that, that was quite powerful the way that she do you think you, that do you think you need that physical separation in order to to have the sort the of mental men separation mm -hmm. the mental yeah. yeah the physical to have the mental i think so yeah um i was just gonna say i think not in this piece but i think somewhere else i think it's sonia johnson but anyway i think it's a she actually um rejects the term separatism because she says that that is still defining your life in relation to men because it's about separating from men and she prefer, i think it's how i might be someone in the chat might put me right but um but she says she prefers the term like a, a lesbian connector or lesbian connections because that's actually more about like the focus of your life as being you know woman-centered so i think that's kind of interesting and i think both of those things i mean i was thinking about and i think both of those i think the idea of separatism to me is still quite powerful and i, I wonder about again if we're talking about things that trying to think of a different way of talking about journeys and stagings that and as Nick said about maybe needing that physical separation as well, that maybe there are different levels to that, that maybe that I feel like that initial act of kind of separatism and, and kind of creating those boundaries is still quite powerful for me. Whereas I'm not sure whether if you were just talking to women about kind of lesbian, what did you say, connected, mm. connectedness, whether, 
whether that whether that brings with it the same kind of power. Mm. But I, mm, but I also do recognise that you are still then talking about you know you potentially then still making main focus of that. Um, but. I wondered as well, I mean, I wonder if this has come up in the chat. I mean, something that I kind of feel particularly at the moment, you know, with all the, you know, just the horrors of what's happening in Afghanistan, like something that does jump out to me is that, you know, the women who wrote these pieces were obviously, you know, highly educated and in lots of ways, um, you know, economically privileged white women. Um, in a particular context at a particular time who were able, I still think it's very courageous um, to be talking about and living separatism in, in the way that they, they did and presumably they still do. But obviously it, it, I think it does presuppose some element of uh, at least some kind of flexibility and some, yeah, some ability to set boundaries and in, in some contexts uh, like it looks it, to to be generous, it looks extremely limited, and so uh, you know to have any kind of uh, flexibility or kind of room to move in terms of setting setting your own boundaries. So I just I, I think it probably is there's a, an obvious criticism of this in a like well what about those women and in, in you know in states where the the choices that look pretty non-existent and that is to do with the overarching political system and then the microcosms of that in each you know sort of you know patriarchal family setup and what about them and if if those of us who can decide to go and create these les um, lesbian separatist spaces well isn't that kind of a, 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 some kind of escapism that isn't available. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I just think, you know, obviously what's, what's, what's going on in Afghanistan is just kind of shouting out. It, uh, so I don't know, it's something that I that's true. One, like, wonder about and uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe that would be something that gets discussed in the chat, but I do have a lot of, what Sonia John says, it seems to me to make a lot of sense that you have to create if you want something at all you have to kind of create more space for the possibility of that mm -hmm. and i don't really see that endlessly trying to lobby and persuade men to change is is very effective in, in, yeah. you know but and she talks about the fact that we live out so that women sort of live outside of patriarchy like where we live sort of psychically and spiritually is, is outside of that and so therefore that's where that's where we can affect change, which I thought was interesting. I wasn't sure what I thought about that in terms of is that where we live? Is that is that where women live? So I think, you know, do we live outside of outside of that kind of system? But I thought that, mm. that was kind of interesting around because it sort of as Nick said about the sort of the, the physical space, then creating that kind of psychological space as well. That a lot of it for me in terms of separatism and thinking about like how different things might be for me personally than they were a few years ago is also around kind of those more acts of separation how much that kind of sort of frees your mind from having that kind of male in the head all of the time and so I thought that the Sonia Johnson piece where she talks about where where else women are living that isn't necessarily where they're, where they're, where they're physically located but and I thought that was quite quite interesting in terms of thinking about yeah just our own our own lives and our own yeah our own thought processes and how much they're constrained by patriarchy or are they mm. not, which I thought was quite an interesting idea. I mean, I think, is it Janice Raymond as well who talks about like sort of this insider outsider mm -hmm. um, thing of, uh, you know, Sonia Johnson, certainly everything I've read, but read to a person, she really rejects any kind of um, campaigning feminism or, you know, Sort of lobbying or any anything that involves trying to change men, and she says like she wouldn't go on any more marches or you know any, this kind of thing. Whereas someone like Janice Raymond, I remember her actually. I think we we were at Femish Fest. So I remember her saying, um, "You have to be in the public domain. You have to be at the meetings. You have to be you know very much kind of involved in these patriarchal sort of like places where decisions get made." And um, so 
But I think if you're going to do that, if you're coming from a separatist perspective, like what you bring to those, um, I suppose Julia Penelope talks about this as well in the lesbian perspective, like what you bring to it is very, very different than if you spent your whole time kind of in, embedded in that. And it, I, I think that's that's maybe that's a sort of really a, a useful way of thinking about it because I'm sure we've all found as well, like in like, so for example, in the women's sector, there is often just this complete assumption of inevitable heterosexuality is that that's just so kind of just given it's it's yeah. not even mentioned because it and if you bring another kind of consciousness to that it can be we can find it quite shocking on my <laughs> own quite alarming and you think well yeah but you're you're working every day with women who've been really horrifically um you know violated and mm-hmm. you know abused by men so why then like it's surely your your viewpoint that heterosexuality is more is a lot more a lot weirder than yeah it's like you know if you keep putting your hands in the fire it's gonna it's gonna hurt every time <laughs> and i think obviously i guess the thing that's interesting about that is obviously my my whole experience in the in the women's sector which you know has not which has been mostly quite a positive experience has been that that's the case that you know it would be considered extremely strange to to start talking to women um you know, accessing services about the kind of possibility of, you know, lesbianism or even, you know, celibacy or just moving away from, from men at all. But obviously that isn't the way that it's always been. So I guess that's kind of, you know, it's interesting for me that obviously women do talk about the fact that, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, that that was very much something that was discussed, um, you know, which, which kind of shows maybe sort of where we are today, that you know, even in organisations that take a, a slightly more kind of maybe radical feminist perspective around sort of men's violence against women, that there is still, you know, there's, there's still a line um, and that, that line is obviously very, very different to, to where I hear things used to be, but I've never had that experience, so <laughs> never had that Jodie experience. Wasn't so, even, Jodie wasn't I, even born, I, I, she's, I several, <laughs> she's about a decade off of but, even being born at the time. But I know that there you know, there have been women maybe that are, you know, that are, are on Zoom or whatever who, who have had that experience and it's always mm-hmm. quite, it's always quite fascinating to me because mm-hmm. it's, you know, we still, and, and it, again, it's just the climate also around kind of things around transgenderism and, and all of that that means that also we, we also have to be focused on that you know we have to be really focused mm-hmm. on protecting the small number of spaces that, that we do have from that particular threat which also then potentially limits expanding other areas of possibility because we've got a, a, a very direct threat that's sort of mm-hmm. preventing other other discussions i was just thinking when you mentioned transgenderism there as well like you know here's me talking about how much these essays on separatism resonate with me and then I just think I've, I haven't used the word penis as much in my entire life as I have in these last like <laughs> three years and all the all the songs that I've made up but, and I am I think oh god please don't like what is going on I just keep singing these it's almost become my little trademark now at some of these events of singing a song with the word penis in. so like well you know so I just think that you know I don't know I suppose yeah. There's a there's a bit of a there's always a bit of a gap between maybe some of the things that I'm thinking or maybe aspiring to, and then when we find ourselves faced with this threat, that you end up kind of uh, doing like you know basically being in that kind of response mode. But Joe, Joe, are you there? <laughs> I was wondering, Joe, did you want to kind of come come? We've got about ten minutes left, so I don't know if there's been or I don't know if Ebru is there. If there's um, if there's stuff in the hi yes other other women's perspective you want to in, involve or if you want to say something yourself joe after yeah yeah well um so i'm going to uh, tell you a well, uh, point you to a question in the chat which is um uh from madalika agarwal and she says i'm going to read it slowly because it's, it's quite complicated Lib Femmes argue that separatism is contradictory to the idea of feminism, that sex-based oppression is social, and there is nothing natural about it, because it implicitly assumes that men are a lost cause, inherently bad. Could you address this? 
So I'll read it again so you can think about it. <laughs> so she's saying, Lib Femmes argue that separatism is contrary to the idea of fe feminism, that sex-based oppression is social because there's nothing natural about the oppression. So uh, separatism implicitly assumes that men are a lost cause inherently bad. Now, I don't think Madalika is a Lib Femme, but she's just asking about that argument, if you could address that. Uh do you want to, I don't, I don't mind, but I've spoken a lot, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I suppose I, I was just going to say that I don't think it necessarily is saying that men are a lost cause. I think it's also saying that why is it necessarily, I would say that why would it be women's jobs to try and get into that domain of being interested in, in changing men? Obviously men are the ones in a position men are the ones in a position of power and that doesn't I don't think that that necessarily that thinking that means that it's saying that there's anything necessarily natural or biological mm -hmm. about it or that there's no room for change but just that mm -hmm. it's about kind of um being quite separate from that ourselves and around kind of focusing on women isn't really giving men that that kind of attention to mm -hmm. to make any of those decisions so I, I wouldn't say that to me that it means that it would be saying that therefore men are a lost cause, it's just mm. that, that that's not where mm. women's mm. ages should be. But Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. I suppose there's something about if, if all women denied men access to them, they would have to buck up their ideas and change, so... <laughs> <laughs> buck up their ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Another, I, I, uh, yeah, go on. I think, I think, uh, yeah, I think that's a bit of a false premise as well. I agree with Jodie because I think a separatist stance doesn't doesn't say anything. Maybe women within, you know, who are separatists have different views or may or may not have different views about social constructionism or, uh, you know, inherent biological traits or whatever. But I don't think there's anything in the act of separatism that actually presupposes that, that men's violence or you know oppression is um is in biologically inherent but it's about um it's about it, well it's about them <laughs> fucking up their eyes but it's not really about that but that probably would be quite a useful byproduct of it, byproduct of it. but i think it's about as fries talks about setting boundaries and then there's a really nice quote i wonder if i can find it where she says that um um uh that by denying access, you are involved in an act of redefinition. You're redefining who you are because you're not providing this access. You're not fulfilling this social role of, of you know, being a you know, feminized woman. And she says that um, the shift of usage, like when, when, you, when women stop behaving in this way, then we redefine ourselves. And the shift of usage of the languages is, is pressed on others by a change in social reality. It does not await their recognition of our definition of authority. I don't know quite if that, that's, I've taken that a bit out of context, but she says, when women separate, we are simultaneously controlling access and defining. We are doubly insubordinate since neither of these is permitted. And I think that's what it's about. It's not, and, um, and, um, Anyway, like men are a lost cause. Look at all the look at all the endless, endless, endless attempts to get men to change. Like on a micro level, if a woman was in a relationship with a violent man, would we not feel more confident of her future well-being and happiness if she left him? And you know, in the safe, you know, safe way that you know other women support her, that she left him and then set about doing what she wants with her life. Then if she endlessly stayed with him for the rest of her life trying to change him uh, i think that's what that's basically what separatism is and there's that quote who's probably some terrible male ec economist but he says like in the long run we're all dead and that is what happens like you know and you want to spend your life endlessly trying to change this man or change men as a as a class or not and yeah, yeah so i've, I've, got, I've, I've got, got another question i wanted to ask you is um in lockdown uh, there was this everyone's invited uh, realisation coming to consciousness of a lot of young women in schools and early university. What a lot of them said is that they, because they had space away from school and away from being 
um, even if it was an all-girls school, there was just so much work and they never had time to process anything. They had time, so it's a sort of temporal separatism that they actually had processing time. And then they had time to talk to their friends and they found out that their friends had the same thing, that the boys that they came across or young men wanted to choke them or something. And they then... Um, came to a consciousness that this was outrageous what how young men are behaving now if you, what would you say to young women who are sort of between 16 and 23 about uh how to deal with all of this i, I feel like i've said loads so i don't know and you understand that maybe from like your, you were saying before about your experiences you, i don't know do you want to say the same thing to, I'm sure there's loads of young women who are watching this on a Sunday morning. I have a daughter who's aged between 16 and 23 and I tell her, just listen to your gut and if, if something doesn't feel right, then don't do it. And I think it's also about, you know, young women, um, again, you can't really, you can't have that kind of consciousness without having some of that separation and certainly a lot of the young women that we've worked with um, over lockdown, maybe some ways lockdown has been quite difficult because it's been quite isolating, but as you say, it also kind of takes them away from a lot of those spaces where they're either receiving abuse or if it's not direct abuse, then it's at least kind of, you know, sexism and misogyny and kind of, you know, an underlying current of things. And I think young women talking to each other would be the thing that I would say to keep having those conversations is one of the most important things is having that space where being able to kind of share some of those experiences because there is a real sort of normalization of sexual violence against you know young women and kind of things that young women are expected to do and I think that you know that kind of feeling of alienation that you're the only one and that maybe you're the only one that feels uncomfortable with anal sex you know young women might think that because everybody else is doing it um that therefore that they're, they're kind of alone and they're not alone so actually i think even just young women being able to to take those experiences and share them with each other about how they feel is really significant um because otherwise you get really sort of young women get really sort of trapped in this idea that, that they're the only one but i think but as long as as long as those young women stay heterosexual nothing really is going to change well, not even really, nothing is going to change because you can have all this race consciousness and have all these discussions. But as long as you're in a kind of a matrix where if you're not feminine and feminized, you're basically unlovable. And that means you're going to die a horrible, lonely death and no one's going to, you know, that, as long as you're in that's such a powerful form of social control. And I think you can have all these discussions at, uh, about it, but it's kind of like this. I just see unless it kind of it stops short of exactly what needs to happen i mean i think you're right but i think that there's also something around the fact that that kind of that sort of consciousness and that speaking to other young women about it can be a step to that so i agree that it's not the be all and end all and that obviously what needs to happen is you know young women not, need to not be in those relationships with young men but i do think that there's something quite powerful about young women coming together to understand those kind of shared experiences and to kind of have more of a sort of collective response to that because I just think otherwise it is quite mm. isolated. But it depends how far it goes because yeah. you can have these discussions but then if it doesn't kind of, it it, yeah. it kind of just gets, it's like it's the circuit kind of gets blocked yeah. and goes. Through. So you can have all these you can have these kind of outlets of, and obviously heterosexual women do this all the time of, you know, getting mm -hmm. together and having a good old moan about their husbands but as, unless it kind of goes into that political domain of actually taking the next step I think it just ends up it, it, they, those things serve as a, as a kind of almost it could be almost an enabling thing like mm -hmm. to keep women within heterosexuality yeah. That, um, that, yeah anyway Joe seems to have gone <laughs> are we over Yes, I, I I don't know what happened, uh, but almost yeah, the time is almost out. So uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions, extra questions or anything like that. I'm not seeing that. Do you have anything to add to the general uh, conversation, or just to round it up? Now Joe's back. 
Mm-hmm. Joe's back. You had a little separatist moment there. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. I had to go into my meta patriarchal space. Oh, good for you. I don't blame you. <laughs> I just can't be bothered with all this talking about all oh, this. Oh, right. Don't live it. It's absolutely. Oh, so, Ebru, you're are you winding up everything now? Yeah. Yeah, I was. I was just about to say that we're almost uh, out of time, and uh, I don't see any other questions. Someone seemed to have raised hand but I don't see that either now so uh, I was going to thank everyone for joining Jody, Julia, Nick and and I can't see who but I'm sorry uh, yeah yeah that's it I think yeah and I, I'd like to say next, thank next you. week maybe we yeah maybe yeah I'd like to say thank you to everybody who's been here and it's just been a fantastic discussion. I think we need to continue or we uh, I'd like if we can uh, to continue this format. It was so interesting hearing you all and and then uh, the the chat was so interesting as well. There's just so much to say. And then uh, thank you to Ebru who is here. So we're a brilliant sisterhood is powerful. So um, uh, great. OK, and you've seen next week we've got uh, Sheila and Sheila Jeffries and Marion Rutigliano, you've probably said, doing Unpacking Queer Politics. And uh, Julia and Jodie and Nick and Anne, do you want to say goodbye quickly? Just... Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye. Okay. <laughs> Let's say goodbye okay. like that. Okay. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>